Thank you for listening to the message today. We would love for you to share in the comments how God is speaking to you through his word. If you would like to join our online church community, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon on our YouTube page so you're notified when we post a new weekly sermon. You can also learn more about The Rock Church by visiting our website, rockag.com. If you are in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area, make sure to come visit us for Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. We would love to meet you in person. And if you would like to support this ministry today, you can donate by visiting our website and clicking the giving tab at the top of the page or by texting the amount you would like to give to the number 84321. Then follow the instructions in the text reply. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you. How's everybody doing? Having a good week, enjoying your summer break? Yes, no, you're not? (laughs) Well, Pastor Jill and I, we go back to school tomorrow. We, uh, we have a week worth of training, and then we are with students a uh, week from tomorrow. So how many of you would like to be in front of a group of middle schoolers? Would you rather be up here preaching? <laughs> well, I'm Pastor Steve. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Rock Church. Last Sunday, I was uh, in AJ preaching there. That's where Pastor Jill is today, so I haven't got to hear my wife preach, and she hasn't got to hear me preach, but it's okay. She's heard me talk a lot, so we're all good. Well, there's a story told about a visiting preacher, and while I'm not visiting, I am here. Um, I don't normally preach on Sundays, at least not in here. I did a lot in kids' church. I'm going to get that off without, there we go. Try not to spill it. Well, there's a visiting preacher. And when he came to the pulpit, he had a big pitcher of water, set it right beside, this is just a little cup here. This will come into play in a moment. And as he's preaching, he had a cup there, and he was pouring water in, and he's drinking it as he's preaching, which is a common thing to do. But he's preaching, he's half an hour into it, and he pours that cup full again, and he drinks, and hour into it, and he pours more in that cup, and he's drinking, and hour and a half into his sermon, he's pouring more water in that cup, and he's drinking. Two hours into his sermon, he's pouring cup in. After two and a half hours, he finally found out of water, ran out of water, and he closed his sermon. And a lot of times, you know, the pastors will go be at the door and shaking hands as people leave, and, and one guy comes up to him and says, you know what, that's the first windmill I ever heard that would run on water. Now, just to let you know, I only have a cup up here, but if I run out of water, um, I have a thermos over there that I can drink up, so be prepared. It's it's not going to be long. It's not going to be long. Rock Church has something that we are using to um, reach the vision of what God wants to do with the church, which is to go in all the world and make good disciples. And it's called Reach. And how many of you have heard of REACH before? It's on the, there. Um, what it stands for is R, is to reach local neighborhood community. We are really focusing on the area around the church when we do our door hangers for our different things we do. We're focusing on this area, because, and we're seeing results of it too. But we're reaching our local community. We're evangelizing the world, obviously, is what we want to do. We assist native and rural churches, commission teams, Pastor has a desire to plant more churches and to send more people out. So that's why we're developing the teams. And to help and equip future pastors and lay leaders, which uh, we're doing a lot through our intern program. So it's all good of how we're developing, reaching the world, of reaching um, what God has wanted us to do. Now, we're doing a sermon series called Reach, and it's not covering each one of these points, but it's just the idea of reaching out to our community. Um, As an introduction, not to reach, but Pastor Jill and I just returned from vacation two weeks ago. We had a wonderful time up in Montana. Saw a lot of great things. We were able to spend about three weeks in Montana at her family's cabin up by a mountain lake. And we saw some unexpected things. You can go to that first slide. (laughs) 
we knew there was snow coming. I mean, that was that rumor. But in Montana, you can expect snow any time during the year. We got about three inches of snow. But during our time there, we had snow, sleet, hail, rain, sunshine, fog. So we were just covering the whole year of seasons in one short space. Um, thing. Um, we experienced temperatures from in the 90s up in Montana to in the 20s. So here when you guys were at 115 and we were like at 28, it was like, I'm still glad we're inside. So it was all good. Um, we were aware of the possibility of snow, but we, I was not expecting three inches. Uh, a couple weeks before, they got like eight or nine. So it was just kind of kind of interesting. I know here we are in, in Arizona. We don't think of snow, but it was, it was a reality. Um, there was enough um, for Pastor Jill to even make a snowman, which is our next slide. There we go. She decided to decorate a little bit. I mean, it was, it was probably about a foot and a half tall. So it was, but I mean, it was, it was snow. She was making a snowman. I was sitting inside reading. You want to go make a snowman? Nope. We lived in Montana numerous times, and um, one of the great benefits of living in Arizona is you don't have to shovel sunshine. So that's a good thing. Um, we saw a lot of other things. Um, there were, where we were at, there were both black bears and grizzlies. Um, we did not see them. We went hunting for them. We did not get to see them. Um, our first day up at the cabin, um, Jill has family that have cabins up by the lake, and up by their house, she posted a picture of a black bear, and we went flying up there in the car. It was already gone. But um, there were also moose at the lake, and we looked for moose, and we couldn't find any. We looked and looked and looked. And every time we would look, somebody would post, oh, they were here. And when we were driving home, her older brother goes, There's something about these big dogs in, the, in our yard, and it was a moose in his yard. So, um, but we did see several elk. We saw a lot of deer, way too many gophers. But I have a, a picture, and then we're going to do a video um, I'll show you kind of where this is. Um, right here is a deer. Pastor Jill thinks it was a mama deer. And here is a cow elk. There was another deer over here. But um, we saw something very, very unexpected. Now, you've got to figure out a deer <sighs> dressed out about 100 pounds. They're not big. They're good to eat, but they're not big. But uh, a cow moose or a cow elk... 350, 400 pounds. It's a good size animal. The unexpected thing, and I got this one on video, I want you to go ahead and watch what happens next. I showed that to my father-in-law, my brother-in-law. They had never seen or heard anything like that of a deer chasing away an elk. Well, that was pretty cool. So that was uh, one of the very unexpected things that uh, we saw up there. We were, I mean, that was when we were looking for moose, and that's what we saw. So, well, the text I'm going to use today is a familiar text um, it's probably a story you may have heard before. But it speaks of both an expected, of an expected and an unexpected encounter. It was a normal part of Jesus' life, which is the expected part, but it was not what the Samaritan woman was expecting. I know in our lives we have a lot of things happen. Things happen, good, bad, whatever. And, you know, a lot of times, I mean, like last night, we go and <laughs> there's water dripping under the sink in the kitchen. Where did that come from? That was unexpected. But I've come to discover in my life 
that what is not expected by me is not a surprise to God. And whatever you're going through, what, when something comes up, where did that come from? It did not come as a surprise to God. And we can take courage in that. And, I, and I've gotten to the point anymore of when something like that happens, it's like, okay, God, what are you going to do now? So God knows. So we just have to trust in him. But our text today is out of John chapter 4. The story itself is in almost the entire chapter, 1 through 30, and then 39 through 42. I am not going to read you the whole chapter. I made a mistake and did that last week in AJ, and I think the people were asleep before I even got through. So I decided to change things up a little bit. I'm going to be only reading the first um, 10 verses. Um, the title of my message is Reaching the Lost as we reach. So the first 10 um, verses I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation, John 4, verses 1 through 10. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, but Jesus himself did not baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord, we, uh, the stories in the Bible, Lord, the teachings, the songs, Lord, they do all these things. They, they encourage us. They correct us. They train us. They teach us to be more like you. They give us direction in our life, Lord. And we thank you that your word does that. Jesus, I pray that I would get out of the way of what's being said, Lord Jesus, and that your heart would be shown, Lord, which is to reach the lost. Lord, you came to seek and save the lost. And we thank you for that, Lord. And Jesus, I pray you would give us ears to hear. Lord, you would hear what you would have to say to us. You would help us to understand in our minds, Lord Jesus, and you would change our hearts to be more like you. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in these times, Lord, and let your word go forth. In your name we pray. Amen. How many of you like to go out and witness to people? Nobody. Wow. It's not just the greatest joy in your life. How many of you, it makes you nervous? It makes me nervous because you put yourself out there. And I mean, the way the world is going, you aren't sure what's going to happen. Because sometimes people are a little bit crazy. But Jesus, you know, we, we just read they'd been walking, he was tired. I mean, it, I, I like the word it says that he was weary. How many of you have been weary? I am. Quite often at about uh, 4 o'clock on weekday afternoons after spending eight hours with middle schoolers. I'm weary. But Jesus was weary. He was tired. But he still had what he knew was his job to do, to seek and save the lost. And this woman came. And a lot of times when we're going to be talking to people, because God's going to bring people your way, is what Jesus did in the first part. He just opened his mouth and had a conversation with her. He just talked. Jesus talked with the woman. In verse 7, it says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. 
And this was unexpected for the woman. It was like, who, what? Because that was a Jewish man speaking to a Samaritan woman, and that did not happen. And she was surprised, but Jesus wasn't. Well, they came, Jesus came to the town called Sychar, and he decides to stop for a rest. He sits down by a well, and he's probably wishing he had a bucket to draw some water. Because, you know, when you're in Arizona, we like to have our water. Are you measuring this to how much I have left to go on my sermon? I'll just sip then. The disciples have gone into this Samaritan village to buy some food. And the woman arrives in the normal course of her day to fetch water. In other words, it's an everyday encounter. How many of you have everyday encounters? It can be at the store. It can be at your workplace. It could be a neighbor. I mean, wherever you go, we can have everyday encounters. And as I said before, she's a Samaritan woman. Jesus is a Jewish man, and by all rights, they should ignore each other. But what does Jesus do? He starts a conversation, just talks. As a very threatening statement, please give me a drink. Is that threatening? Would that be threatening to anybody? It wasn't. There was nothing intimidating or threatening about the way that Jesus begins. In fact, it is a very natural conversation starter, and we know that especially in Arizona. Where's the water? Can I get some water? I hear that all the time from my middle schoolers. And 10 minutes later, they got to go to the bathroom. And 10 minutes later, they got to get another drink of water. And 10 minutes later, it's, it's quite amazing. But to ask for a drink of water is not an intimidating way. Jesus was not trying to intimidate her. He was not trying to threaten her. He wasn't showing his superiority over her. He just asked her a simple, non-threatening question. And what's interesting is he actually puts her in a power, uh, or in a, um, whoops, what did I say? I want to make sure I say this right. He put this in a position of power over him because she's asking He's asking her for a favor of water. But he's doing more than that. And he took the opportunity that God had given him to make a connection with this woman so that he can tell her the gospel. He can share with her the good news. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us that we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And if we're to be the salt of the world salt of the earth, then we need to season our conversations with salt, which is speaking of God's word. Our conversations need to be about God. Now, I'm not saying we're going around preaching to everybody, but you can let your natural conversation flow. And what I love is how Jesus was able to take this conversation he's having with this woman and direct it to the things of God. It's something so simple, our conversations, as even asking someone for a drink of water, and that's what Jesus does here. He takes an ordinary situation, an ordinary conversation, and he turns it around to a conversation about eternal life. And the conversation is with a very ordinary woman. And the thing is, it is not someone that you would pick to be a convert. With working at the middle school... I have a lot of students who are experimenting with a lot of different things. Clothing styles, dress, it's very interesting. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's absolutely hilarious. Um, But we need to remember that no matter how people look, if they're different to us, the same as us, If they don't know Jesus, they are lost. They need Jesus. And they may be hurting more than you think, and they be more open to the gospel than you might believe if we would just sit down and have a conversation with them. 
I try to be very approachable to my students. I've had one of my favorite students last year, she's, and this is a middle schooler, she's about this tall. And her name was Grace. And she just thought I was the best. She loved me. I loved her. It was just, it was fun. I could get around with her. She didn't like it being corrected. She got really mad at me one day. But, but we can have conversations if they're different. I have conversations with my students. Now, I may not be able to preach the gospel to them, but I can share character traits of what I believe, of who I am. The students know who I am. Some of them ask questions. Some of them find out that I'm ministers. I'm a minister. Some of them even looked it up on the internet and found me on Rock Church. You're a pastor. Yes, I am. So, but we can just have conversation. Talk. Talk. I know some of you will talk and talk and talk, and then it comes that time where you really can, and you clam up. Just have a conversation. Just talk. Let God lead it. The second thing that I found very interesting is that Jesus did not condemn this woman. In verses 16 through 18, Jesus told her to go get your husband. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, we, we know what Jesus could have condemned. There are several times in scriptures when a woman caught in adultery, where was the guy at, um, was brought before him, and they wanted to stone her. What should we do? Jesus didn't say anything. He could have condemned her. The scriptures say he could have condemned her. She could have been stoned. But he didn't say anything. He didn't condemn. That woman's life was changed. The Samaritan woman's life was changed, but it wasn't through condemnation. Now, as we watch the news, or I guess it's the Jerry Springer syndrome. Some of you might know what that is. People don't have conversations anymore. They yell and scream. And the winner is the one that yells the loudest and the longest. I've watched some YouTube videos. They're absolutely hilarious. But it's like, but condemning people, it doesn't work. Because if you're condemned or if you're corrected with something, the first thing we do is we put up a wall. If you do something that someone else doesn't like and they call you out on it, whether you know, you're right or wrong, we put up a wall. And they'll do the same thing. And they'll use that as a way to not have to listen to the gospel. They're hurting. They're lost. They're looking for something that will make a difference in their life. They're looking. But condemnation is not the answer. Because I guarantee you, we probably cannot condemn them more than they already condemn themselves. And Jesus did not condemn them. Jesus did not condemn this woman. She was an outcast of society. She was a Samaritan woman, for starters. But even beyond that, of being married five times and she was living with a guy that she wasn't even married to, she knew what her lifestyle was. She knew she was in the wrong. How do we know that? She was getting water in the middle of the day. You know when the women of that time went and got water? In the evening, morning or evening. She went when there would be nobody there. She already felt condemned in herself. Having Jesus condemn her would not have helped her one bit. And it doesn't do any good for us to condemn the lost. We might know they're lost, but does Jesus say condemn? No, Jesus says to love. First commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second commandment, love your neighbors yourself. 
Your neighbor is not just the Christian sitting next to a church. Your neighbor is the one that is across the street. It's the drug addicts, the alcoholics, murderers, gossipers, liars, cheats. I mean, we could go through all of the Ten Commandments. They're our neighbor. They're who we need to reach out to. They're the lost that need Jesus. So Jesus did not condemn her, even though he could have. The third point I want to make is that Jesus did not let her distract him from his purpose. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. That was his mission. And you know what? It's our mission too. We are right now Jesus' voice. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are the ones that go out into our world. We, we, that's how we share the gospel. Um, like I said, I work at, at Cooley Middle School. I'm a middle school teacher, seventh grade English special education teacher. It's a ball. Some days are more of a ball than others. But the one thing that keeps me going above anything else, and just to let you know, when um, I started working at the, the middle school, I did not apply for the position there. I did not want to work at a middle school. Middle schoolers drove me nuts. Parents, do your middle schooler, no, I won't have, have you respond, especially if the kid's right next to you. I did not want to work with middle schoolers. But the thing is, is, and when the, the vice principal called me up for the interview, um, I didn't call him back for two days. It's like, I don't want to work with middle schoolers. And my wife, the great theologian, the great compassionate woman of God that she is, says to me, what do you got to lose? She goes, you can always say No. I went to the interview, and I don't remember ever saying yes or no, but all of a sudden I'm working there. <laughs> um, I was working at a custodian at one of the elementary schools at that time, and the assistant principal came out and goes, congratulations on your new job. I said, what new job? She goes, well, you're going to be working, you know, as an aide at, at Cooley. They never told me. <laughs> And I mean, but the thing is, God in his ultimate wisdom and sense of humor placed me in a middle school and I absolutely love it. And God has, I mean, there are days like with any mission that you're on that are good and some aren't as good. But the thing that really helps me is that God has put something in my mind that that is my mission field. I am a missionary to that middle school, not just to the students, but to the teachers, to the staff. And they know I'm a minister. They know I'm a pastor. Um, I pray for them. But that's where God has placed me. Now, I'd like to say that every one of the teachers there is a godly man and woman, that they are living for God, but there are some that aren't. But you know what? I found out they can be my friend. One in particular has, he posts things very opposite of what I believe. And he's one of my really good friends at the school. And I don't condemn him. I work with him, talk with him. He's been my buddy for years that we've been working there. Um... And God has really been putting him more on my heart of this. I don't know if he's the only reason, but he's a big reason of why I'm here. And we have conversations and we talk. And he has good days, he has bad days. But that conversation and not condemning, 
But back to my point, that Jesus didn't want us to allow them to get off topic because she kept trying to change the subject. She kept focusing, Jesus would say something, oh, how about over here? And then it's like, uh, what's that movie, Up, with Doug the dog, squirrel. That's kind of how she was. In, in verse 9, the woman was, was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She is pointing out cultural differences. Oh, well, we're completely different. We're very different. But Jesus was not distracted because he was giving her living water. And he was using her coming to get water as an example to show her what the true living water was, which is a relationship with God. I see how I'm doing on time because I promised my oldest son that I would be on time. In verse 20, she tries to change the subject again. She says, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship? Well, we Samaritans claim this here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship. So she is really trying to point out the differences between Jews and Samaritans. But I love how Jesus replied to her and said, you know, ultimately that isn't mattering because there's a time coming where people are going to be able to worship anywhere in spirit and in truth. And it won't matter where you are. You can always worship God. So students, you can worship God at school. Adults, you can worship God at work. Now, I'm not saying we're supposed to walk around raising our hands. But we can live a life by our actions, by our words, that are showing that there is a difference in our life. I love that Jesus spoke at that time when people could worship God anywhere. And I'm, we're in that time now. And when I was teaching kids, I really tried to impress upon them as... Jesus isn't just a church. If you make a mistake and you feel sorry for it, you can talk to God wherever you're at and ask God to forgive you. Because God is with us always. He does not leave us. He promised he would never leave us. He promised he would never forsake us. He sent the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, our counselor, to be with us wherever we go. I'm so thankful for that. Well, she tried to change the subject one more time. She said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And she was looking toward the future, and most, well, I won't say most, but many Jews are still looking to the future Messiah, not realizing that they missed it. Jesus was telling her that that time was now. The Messiah was there with her right then. Now, we, we, we hear that, you know, these ways of, you know, how Jesus did it. How Jesus was reaching the lost, this lost woman. And we go, but that was Jesus. I am not Jesus. You ever said that? The thing is, is the bigger impact is what happens next in the story. And this is the difference that Jesus made. In verses 28 through 30, it says the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. There was not a bit of the gospel message there. It was like, whoa, he's here. Come. Now remember, she was a despised woman. She was getting water in the middle of the day. Everyone in town knew about this woman. And she went, the difference that Jesus made, she went to them where they were at and had them come. And they came going, what is she going on about? Who is this?
her personal testimony, what Jesus did for her, was a difference that Jesus made. I've talked to people, and they will dispute the, the accuracy of the Bible. They'll say it was just an old message, old thing, you know. But you know what I found out? They may be able to try to dispute the Bible, but they cannot dispute what God has done in your life. They cannot dispute your personal testimony. So you may not know the Bible very well. We're learning. We're growing. We're reading the Bible. We're studying. We come to church. We go to Bible study. These different things that we grow as a person. But they cannot dispute what God has done in your life. They cannot fight your personal testimony. Now, I've been a Christian for my whole life. I cannot remember a time where I was not a Christian. And I've had, with being a minister, I've had times you had to write, when were you saved? You know, give a date. I have no idea. I really don't. I do know that there came a time in my life where I realized that my sin was keeping me from God and I needed to have forgiveness. I needed a Savior. And I asked Christ into my life. The thing is, is people go, I mean, and there's times that I've thought, well, that's just kind of a real boring testimony. But the, the last year or so, I've really, as I've thought about it, I was just as lost, whether I was three or four when I asked Christ in my life, I was just as lost as the worst sinner. Until we have Christ in our life, we are lost we need a Savior. You need to have someone in your life that will make a difference, that will take you from death into life, from being blind to being, to being able to see, from being lost to being found. That's the difference that Jesus makes. That's the difference that Jesus makes. What I love is in verses 39 through 42, and I need you to, to, to hear this first part. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. To this time, they still had not met Jesus. They had not been with him. By her testimony of what Christ did in her life, they went out to see. It goes on to say, when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but, but because we have heard for ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Jesus had an impact on that woman. That woman had an impact on that village. You do not know the impact that you will have by sharing your faith with somebody. Every person that is saved has had someone share the gospel with them. Every one of us at one time in our life was lost. The only future we had was eternity in hell. That was the only future we had. But when we ask Christ into our life and he forgives us and makes us new, we are no longer held to that. We have been set free. We are what they call born again. That we are made new. We have been purified. We've been made clean. We are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. That is the impact of Jesus in your life. And that will be the impact when you share Jesus with others, of what Christ has done for you. You do not need to be a Bible scholar to tell what Jesus has done for you. I doubt this woman had ever seen a Bible in her life. And yet, by the word of her testimony, her village was changed. 
What about your workplace? Think about the impact that you could have. I think about my school all the time. With those kids, lost, looking for something. With the teachers, some of them the same way. But what is the impact that you can make? What can you do? To recap the four points, the number one is talk. We have to talk to them. Second point is don't condemn. Third is stay focused. They'll try to change the subject. God will help you bring it back to him. But remember the power of your personal testimony of how you were lost. You're now found. The power, the impact of what Jesus has done in your life. My, my question for you is how are you reaching where God has placed you? Do those around you know that you have the good news? When I was in school a long time ago, high school, I keep looking back and going, man, how am I that old already? And I lived a good life. I was a good person. I wasn't mean to people. And yet people didn't know I was a Christian. Because I didn't speak. I didn't share the good news of what Jesus did in my life. I didn't share the impact that Jesus made in me. And I look back with regrets but, you know, like the song said, we can't go back to the yesterdays. And we can plan for the future and make things for the future, but right now is where we're at. What decisions are you going to make right now that are going to impact other people's eternal future? How are we sharing the good news with Jesus? How are you reaching the lost? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I know that as I've been working on this sermon, Lord, I've been convicted. And I think of the times in my life that I haven't done everything that I need to have done to share the good news. And Jesus, I cannot change the past, but Lord, I can change what I'm doing now. And Lord, I, I think about it especially as I start with going back to school tomorrow, teaching in a week. Lord, how can I impact those kids for all eternity, Lord, by how I live my life, by what I say? Lord Jesus, I just pray you would let each one of us, Lord, think of our lives, Lord Jesus. Think of our testimony of what you've done in our life, the difference that you've made in our life. And Lord, how you can share that, they can share that with those around them. Thank you, Jesus. With heads bowed and with eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life before. You're kind of like that Samaritan woman, but you didn't know. But Jesus is still at the well. And he's still sharing that living water. And if you're here today and you'd like to have Jesus forgive you of what you've done, you want to have your sins forgiven, the things you've done wrong taken away, if that's you, I'd like you to raise your hand real quick and put it right back down. Amen. I see your hand. Anyone else? Well, I'd like us all to repeat this prayer after me. We're just going to do a simple prayer. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Be my friend and my Savior. 
Forgive me of the wrongs I've done and give me new life in you. Let your living water flow in me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you've made that decision, I want to talk to you after service and just come up here and I'll talk to you real quick. But I have one more thing I want to ask. And it's something I want you to contemplate because this is what you're going to have to do beyond here. How are you going to impact the world that God has placed you in? How are you going to share the good news with those around you? Talk. Don't condemn. Stay focused. Share what God has done for you. Jesus, I pray a blessing over your people. Lord Jesus, you would give us the courage because I know that first time it is hard to open your mouth, to say, I'm going to pray for you. Or to share what Jesus has done in your life. I know it's hard, but Lord, I pray you would give us the courage. You would give us the strength to begin. That's the hardest part. To begin. Lord Jesus, we don't know how we can impact our world. We don't know how we can impact those around us. Our workplace, our school, the grocery store, the department store, the parks, wherever we're at, Lord Jesus. Let us be those that are your good and faithful servants that are seeking and saving the lost. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. The last thing I want to do today is we're going to take communion. I love taking communion. I know a lot of times there's so many different ways you can take communion attitudes you can have. Um, I am sorry for all that Jesus had to go through for my forgiveness. If you still need um, communion elements, by the way, they're on either side of the table. I'll give you time to get there. But I also like to think of communion as a rejoicing time. It's not forgetting the cost that Jesus paid but it is the joy that we have because God has made us new. And as we take the communion, we identify with his body that was broken for us. We identify with the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And we rejoice. We can be thankful. We can be happy. We can go from here knowing that we're new, that we are forgiven. Now, Does this do do that for us? No. Taking the cracker and the juice does not forgive you. It does not make you eternally secure in Christ. It is daily living a life that is pleasing to him. I want to read you some verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's the Apostle Paul speaking. I try to do this without spilling on myself. Oops. Now we'll get back to that. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. As a reminder, Paul was not there at the, uh, the Last Supper. Jesus revealed this to him. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Announcing. It's good news. We are forgiven. We're made new. So anyone who eats this bread or or drink this cup of the Lord and an unworthy, unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. 
For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That's why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. Jesus' body was broken for us. Brutally, what he went through, because he loved us. Let's take the cup together. Or excuse me, the bread together. (laughs) Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you that by your stripes we are healed, Lord Jesus, and we can claim that healing in your name because that's a promise of your word. We thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you for the cup. We thank you for the blood that you shed, Lord. We don't diminish the pain and suffering that you went through, the anguish that you went through. We do not diminish that, Lord. The sacrifice you made was incredible. But Jesus, we can rejoice because we are made new. By your shed blood, we are, have forgiveness of the things we've done wrong, Lord, and we can have new life because of the sacrifice you made on that cross. We thank you that it didn't end on the cross, Lord, but you rose again. And one day you're going to come back and you're going to take us all to be with you again. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's take the cup. I'd like everyone to stand real quick. There have been several churches that I've visited that have something written on the outside doors that says you are entering your mission field. Our mission field is not within these walls. These walls are important. They are very important. We grow together. We learn from one another. We learn from God's word. We worship and pray. We pray for each other. We're healed. These walls are important, but outside the doors are the people that need Christ. They're the ones that are lost and need to be found. Open your mouth. I have a bless, blessing I want to say over you. This is a Levitical bre- blessing from New Numbers. And I'll do this as a close. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week. Open your mouths and share what Christ has done for you. God bless you.